Guys, uh, Rob Wilson again with another episode of the Raw Real Estate Podcast. Thanks for joining. Today I have uh, Dave GM Bruno. What's happening, Dave? Hey, what's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for jumping on. Um, so what I thought we'd cover today is just some of the mistakes that investors make. Dave has, has done a ton of, in fact, we've worked together quite a bit. And, uh, and actually, Dave has helped me out of some pretty challenging projects. Um, do you remember the first, the first one we did? Yeah. Was that about 10, almost 10 years ago now? In, Probably, in, Alma, yeah. in, in Almaden Valley, right? Actually, it was on Almaden Road in downtown San Jose. Oh, I was close, man. Sorry. The, yeah, all, no, it all was uh, over the years. It's just a blur. It was a rough one, actually, that we, we got red tagged on that one. <laughs> we tried to <laughs> do that, do a basement uh, under the covers. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I just I wanted to have you on and just kind of talk through what uh, you see as a lot of mistakes that investors or flippers make when, you know, on doing homes. I mean, obviously, they're usually in, in pretty good shape, the final product. And and if it's a new home and I just I see a lot of um, guys just making mistakes on how they kind of take it to market. They do a great job on the rehab and then, you know, yeah. I think they miss the mark. So I just want to get your feedback. Um and just by way of uh, kind of a, an intro on Dave, I mean, long time, 20 plus years and uh, selling real estate, had your own brokerage for a bunch of years um, mm -hmm. in the uh, Los Gatos, you know, South Bay of the Bay Area, Los Gatos area. And um, just, I mean, I can't say enough about Dave. He's just a stud to work with, uh, does a great job. He's kind of on the cutting edge of all the marketing and online stuff as well as just knows how to work with you know challenging situations with you know either other agents or mm -hmm. the whole buy and sell transaction so anyway a lot to uh lot to learn from dave and um i thought we'd maybe just jump into it um so what do you see like what are the couple big mistakes you see a lot of guys make when they're you know they 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 purchased it maybe they you know got a, a good to great buy done a nice you know final product and then what are kind of the mistakes they make when trying to sell it yeah so great question right and i'll, I'll even take a step back uh before they get to the final product and say that a lot of uh first time or inexperienced investors flippers one uh cutting corners will get you into trouble right i mean you know you you mentioned that deal that got red tagged um but i think in our valley in most areas, our consumers can spot, and especially the agents that work with them, can spot a uh, a cheap flip from a thoughtful one, right? I, you know, the work that you do now, Rod, on on your flips and investment projects. I mean, it's you know, it's it's a ten out of ten, but it's easy to spot the guys that cut corners, didn't use quality material. Um, so, you know, and, and that's stuff that even though we can market it, you know, stage, market, promote the hell out of that house, when you get people in there, that quality matters and, that, and, and the lack of quality shows. So that's one quick thing. The other thing, too, is I am not, I probably shouldn't say this as a licensed broker, but I'm not opposed to doing remodel work without some permits. Right. You have a licensed contractor, you know, GC that you trust. Um, that's a reality. We're in COVID. Everything takes time to get done if you know when you're doing it with permits. So I think there is an acceptable amount of work that can be done. That that said, I draw the line at adding square footage or trying to build out a basement, you know, th those types of things that can come back to bite you. Uh or garage, you know, uh, garage conversion without a permit. Right, because I think what people forget is uh, one, it could be they could get tripped up when they have a buyer that's trying to buy a home because the appraiser calls it out, then the lender has an issue with it and it kills the deal. The other issue that a lot of people don't think about if you convert a garage to living space without a permit and that garage catches fire and they find the insurance company finds out that the cause of the fire was due to an illegal conversion of a garage or some sort of space in a house, they have the right to not cover that um, uh, policy to not honor. Wow. Yeah. So, so you got to be careful again, you, you know, use trusted contractors, handyman, that sort of thing, but there's definitely a line um, that you shouldn't cross when it comes to, to doing things without permits. 
Yeah, I'd say the most for the most part, I've done you know used licensed guys, um, and then you know I always do everything to code. I mean, you, yeah. you, you want to do it to code because just in case you have to go back, at least you know you take a lot of pictures and you have hopefully the city's not gonna not gonna crucify you or the inspector's not gonna make an example of you or something. But um, right. no, that's a that's a really good point, and I, I I you know tend to agree. I mean, I learned my lesson the hard way and and. Yeah you know, prefer to do permits, but if it's just straight cosmetic, obviously, you know, want to get it in and out and back on the market. So that's, that's great feedback. Um, so as far as, okay, so that's, that's kind of, you know, the project side of it. Right. Um, do you have any idea, like what's the, I don't know, I want to say cutting edge, but what's kind of the, you've seen over the last, you know, decade or so that's, that's really important that a lot of guys won't do related to selling and marketing yeah so a couple of things one kind of it i'm preaching to the choir here because i i believe we tend to do things the right way but you'll be surprised somebody will spend you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a flip or a remodel and and they won't stage the house afterwards they they won't spend three grand to stage it you know you got to remember as nice as your product is buyers still lack vision so if you can't design the interior of the home uh, to represent that lifestyle, you, you know, you are potentially turning off buyers uh, because they can't, you know, all they see is, is four empty walls, right? So definitely right. cutting corners on staging. Um, the other thing is, and, and a lot of flippers do this because, you know, they're trying to increase margins and things like that. They don't pay a full commission to the buyer side agent. So, and, and let me yeah. explain why that matters. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, or maybe everybody does, but the commission amount is set by the seller, or, you know, the owner of the property. And then it's typically split between the listing side and the buyer side. Well, in our market right now, customary is two and a half percent to the buy side. Sometimes it's three, but 99% of the time it's two and a half percent. Sometimes these investors will say, well, I only want to pay two, right? Or, or sometimes even less than 2%. The problem with that is even though a real estate agent is ethically, you know, morally required to show all property, they are also independent contractors and don't get paid until a deal closes. So if I'm looking at four homes in a, well, not me because I wouldn't do this, but if an agent's looking at four homes in a neighborhood that are similar, three of them are paying two and a half percent. One of them's paying 2% or less. I can almost guarantee you they're going to focus on those other three properties first. Right. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You, you know, I tell clients all the time, if, if I'm selling my own home, I'm going to offer three and a half percent. I want to pay more than anybody's paying because I want all the attention and focus on my property because I, that's going to allow me to generate more offers and get me more money in the long run. So I want to go back to something you mentioned, and, and I want to get maybe dig a little deeper. You mentioned uh, presenting the life, the kind of the lifestyle, you know, the experience. What do you mean by that? And again, what what are guys missing, or what do you what do you recommend on that front? Yeah, uh, great question. So, you know, in our market, a lot of people are coming from all over, right? Uh, buyers, they could be coming from outside of the Bay Area, a different part of California, outside of the state, or outside of the country. So, you know, I'm, I'm a Bay Area native, born and raised here. So it's, it's easy for me to talk about and articulate the value of a surrounding neighborhood. However, uh, if you're looking online, maybe, um, and you're not from the area, how do you know what the, you know, what's a neighborhood vibe, right? What's a lifestyle around that neighborhood? Is it, you know, a lot of public transportation downtown? Are you by hiking trails, you know, like in Los Gatos or, or parts of South San Jose? So the other thing that I think investors fall short, and I fault the, ag the agent that they work with as much as the investor, is you're not just selling the home, you're selling the lifestyle around it. So if you look at any of the properties that we sell, it is always, uh, they, they're always accompanied with the video of not just the home, but the lifestyle around it. You know, are, are there parks and trails? What's the neighborhood, you know, uh, downtown scene? you know, what's the, you know, what's the restaurant vibe? You know, we want to make sure that, you know, because you only have a certain amount of time to grab the attention of the consumer. We want to make sure that we're telling the entire story of the home, the neighborhood and the lifestyle. 
not just how nice and pretty our house is. No, I, I, yeah, that's, that's great advice. And I actually and related to staging. I mean, that was a, a, I would not, you know, it's kind of like the landscaping, the staging. I feel like a lot of guys will either run out of money or not think it's that important. So they'll do this, you know, great to amazing remodel and then come up short on the landscaping, which is like the first thing you see the yeah. curb appeal. And you got to get that, you know, that money shot of the, uh, of the front. Yep. And then the second thing is just the outdoor spaces, the, you know, the outdoor living areas where they'll, you know, just leave a concrete patio and not, you know, create like a, <laughs> a living area or whatever, you know? Yeah. I, I always tell my investors, go walk a new construction project, right? Go, go walk into that sales office in those model homes. That's what we want to look like. Right. That's the experience we want to give. When you walk into a model, you know, when a lot of consumers walk into a model home, they're like, oh, my God, I could see myself living here. And you're right. Curb appeals on point. The backyard's decked out, um, you know, and the staging and, you know, the, the stage to perfection. Right? right. And you absolutely have to paint that picture for the consumer because they don't always have the vision to see it themselves. Right. OK, let's get into the, I know you're you're super strong on the digital marketing and online related stuff. I mean, what what can you share on that? I mean, what should everyone be doing that you know maybe a lot of them are not? Yeah, uh, YouTube videos I think is a, is a big one, right? Because going back to lifestyle, um, if I'm selling a home in Willow Glen, I'm going to do you know my. I'm going to have my video, my drone guys out there. They're going to do the video of the house. They're going to do the surrounding area, Willow Glen, the downtown area and all of that stuff. And then when I post it to YouTube, um, it's important that, you know, what keywords you use for the subject and then the body of the text, right? Because remember, YouTube's owned by Google. You know, if, if I put in homes for sale in Willow Glen, I want my video to pop up, right? right. Um, because believe it or not, there are still a lot of people that use Google and Facebook to look at properties and not just Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, right? Especially if I'm, if I'm out of the area, I'm going to just Google homes for sale in Willow Glen, right? And, and, right. and so when you want to make sure that your video matches that algorithm so that it's coming up top of mind. If, if you look at anything else right now, you can Google how to change a water heater. And you're going to get like two or three search results and then you're going to get youtube videos right underneath it you know this is something that that uh google has really put front and center over the last year and a half you know they want eyeballs on those videos and so they're going to give you a video solution in addition to a website link to follow so yeah any, any of that stuff right now how, how to change a flat tire you're going to see four or five videos right under the first or second ad link um you know they are they're you know, they are pushing video content above all things right now. So you really got to have a good video and uh, SEO strategy for that. And so is that, do you typically do a single video with drone footage and, you know, a house preview and all that? Or do you do, do you, or you do one of those and maybe chunk them down to a bunch of other ones with, you know, certain keywords or how do you, how do you typically do that? Yeah, we typically just do one video per property. Um, and then we have reoccurring keywords in the subject, right? We have a title that is search engine friendly. You know, we sell, we sell about a hundred, 125 homes a year. So, you know, just by the fact that we've got, you know, 10 or 15 in Willow Glen or Almaden, you know, we, we are, we are reinforcing the fact by the keywords that we're using, um, that we're the experts in that area. Right. Right. So, so you're getting that social proof and validation that that way as well. But yeah, we we have uh, one video starts with the drone overview of the neighborhood, goes into the house, ends with the lifestyle component of it as well, and then we basically explain all that in the the body of the uh, the post on YouTube. Very cool. Um, okay, so you've got people. You get you got the exposure. Um, you've got some interest. Um, I guess, first of all, how much importance do you put on open houses? And then assuming you guys are doing them on every project every weekend, mm -hmm. um, how do you best maximize uh, the open house? Yeah, uh, you know, great question. A lot of times a, an average real estate agent will tell you 
that an open house does not sell a home. The purpose of an open house is for that agent to pick up more buyer clients, right? Yeah. So is, is that the is that the lazy, lazy agent telling you that? Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't say lazy, but but that that's been that's been a common belief amongst agents for a very long time. For sure. I'm doing, I'm doing the open house to get more business, not to sell this house. I feel completely different. Although we do pick up clients at open houses, and it's a great it, it's a great thing for that. I set up our open houses so there's so much energy, excitement, and people through there that the potential buyers get a sense of like, I got to buy this property or else I'm going to miss out. And so we do that in a couple of ways. One, the traditional open house is from 1 to 4 p.m., right, on a Saturday or Sunday. Right. We do 1 to 3 p.m. So we do two hours instead of three. And the reason we do that is we want maximum people through that open house in a compressed period of time because I want people to feel like, oh shit, everybody's looking at this house, I have to have it. Yeah. Right? Versus, versus some agents will spread it out three, four hours and maybe you're only getting four people an hour or eight people an hour. I'm cramming all those sardines into that two hour window because I want them to feel that this is the hottest property on the market right now and I have to have it. I love it. That's, yeah, that's a great idea. And you probably get people that are feeling like they almost have to schedule it versus you have a big window. It's like, oh, we'll get by there. And then yep. you know, you don't versus, oh, well, this one, it's only got a two hour, three hour window. We better you know, make sure we get there first and then we'll hit the other ones. A absolutely. Right. So we typically have people waiting for us when we show up to, to set up for our open houses. Right. Because we're trying to build a tremendous amount of excitement over it. Uh, you know, the other thing that I do, we typically put our homes on the market on a Wednesday, um, you know, go to market on a Wednesday. I right. will not let anybody in that home until the open house. Right. So we're building that anticipation. I don't care if they come with an agent or whatever. That's fine. But again, I want maximum people through that open house to give the perception that it is the hottest property out there. Everybody's looking at when in reality, it may only end up with the same amount of views over the week or 10 day period. But I want it all right there because we know that residential real estate is extremely emotional. And, and when, you know, the emotion that they get from seeing all those people in like, man, this is a hot house. Everybody must want this one. This is the one I have to have. So we're, you know, right. we're trying to tap into that psyche of the consumer to make them feel like, you know, FOMO, right? I can't miss out on this house. Uh, and we've been really successful at it. For sure. No, I, I think, um, you know, the, on the investor side, you experience that when there's a, you know, little window of some off market property and you get all these guys showing up and then you're like, okay, the competitive juices, you know, right. kick in and yeah. you're like, man, I want to, I want to get it, you know, get this deal. Um, so, you know, I appreciate the time, Dave. I know we'll probably do some more of these, but, um, I don't know. I, I mean, just as kind of a, a parting thing, I would say that, I, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. I think a lot of guys, you know, part of this, I was speaking of, um, of uh, keywords and stuff. I was thinking, you know, this would be kind of like, what are the mistakes that a lot of investors make in selling and marketing a property? And, um, you know, I, I could not agree more. In fact, I had a, a recent podcast, you know, talking about color. I think, you know, that yeah. a lot of guys will miss on color. I mm -hmm. think they, you know, definitely miss on, you know, quality, you know, and I've been there, you know, you're, you're, you've got a tight budget you're working with, you're trying to get it done quickly, but man, there's some things that you definitely don't want to skimp on. And my thought on, on that front is if you don't want to, my, I had a pet peeve about front doors and, and, you know, the hardware on a front door and just the quality of the front door. And it's like that first, um, what do you call it? Kinesthetic feeling you get uh -huh. on a house. Yeah. So you come out, the curb appeals, you know, obviously hugely important, but right. you know, if it's a little loose or something or the door doesn't open and close easy, you know, yeah. little things like that, whatever they're touching, I want to be super tight. And again, yeah. some guys, I'm like, dude, you cannot leave this door. It looks like it was, you know, repainted 10 times. Yeah. Great. No, great point. And, and to further that point, I bought a house last year, you know, family home for us in July, we gutted it, remodeled it. I spent a lot of money on my front door. And I tell you what, the first thing people say when they walk in or have like, even when parents came with their kids to trick or treat, they were like, wow, that's a really nice front door, 
right? Yeah, and, and you're right. It's that first impression, that thing, you know, when they come through that threshold and it's a solid door with a good aesthetic, good hardware, I mean, it, it makes a huge difference. So you're right. There's a lot of little things that an investor can do to basically self-sabotage their flip. Right. And, and, and the other, you know, just to kind of wrap up, the other thing too, is make sure you're consulting with your real estate partner or a stager, you know, throughout the process. Right. I, I think a lot of times they have a vision and, you know, maybe their vision's not on trend, you know, for that specific neighborhood. Right. I mean, you know, how you design a house in, you know, Los Gatos is going to be different than how you design a house in the East foothills. Or, or evergreen area of San Jose. So, you know, it's not a one size fits all solution. So by having the right professionals around you through the entire process, I think is going to help alleviate some of those self-sabotaging things that a, uh, a newer investor faces. No, that's a huge tip. I, I, I could not agree more. Well, again, Dave, thanks for the time. We will- uh, Let's do it again soon. Let's wrap this up and we will absolutely do it again soon. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Make sure you guys hit that like button, smash that subscribe button, show Rod uh, a lot of support on his on his podcast and his videos. He's doing a great job. Thanks, buddy, for having me. I appreciate it. All right, Talk to you it. soon. Sweet. Cool. Good enough. I like it. I love it. It's, yeah, it's awesome. Okay. So yeah, uh, you know, put the file in a Dropbox, you know, that, that I can share the link on. And I'll have uh, Jacob uh, chop it up a little bit, right? Clean, clean it up, and then yeah. let's put it out there. Um, are you like posting it on Facebook, or what? What, what are you, you gonna have it live in a couple different places? So I have. I'm honestly, I need to clean up some of my uh, stuff. I mean, my I was just gonna focus like almost 100% initially on YouTube, and then I do have a you know my Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, actually, I'll probably hit uh, Instagram and Facebook, but I was thinking of keeping it off LinkedIn until I get a little, you know, more polished and maybe, maybe your guys version I'll, I'll post on that. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say um, one, yeah, put it on, on all the portals, but two, make sure that um, you uh, upload the file natively to the social platform, not just like link the YouTube video, right? Okay. Because, because what happens is like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, they want their own content. So if you link a YouTube video in Facebook or on LinkedIn, the algorithm doesn't promote it as much as if you upload the file directly to the platform. Sure. Okay. And then the other good thing about that, I'll have to double check if you're doing it on a personal page versus business page, but most of those platforms now, when you upload a video, it will do the, it'll do the auto close caption. So, so it'll generate the text. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And if not, I've got a company called Rev and they'll do this video for like $2 and 50 cents. They'll do the close caption. Okay. And, that's and cool. Cause then you got people, cause they won't, they'll have it on mute, right? It comes. Yeah. Cause when, cause when we're scrolling on the, on our Facebook or most of the time we don't have the volume on. Yeah. Right. But you want to get the words across and can try to right. capture them. So that, that, that's the other good thing too. You know, we'll, we'll make sure that, that we do that. Right on. All right. All right, man. Good shit. Well, I'm off to go schlep some houses. Do it. And, I'm uh, some loans. All right. Sounds good, bud. Okay, talk to you soon. All right, later. Peace. See ya.